Hey, this is Snowblitz. Six string. Starlight Iron Hoof. Four strain. And Zeta Prime. And this is Elements of Harmony. Tonight on the show, we interview one who is strong with the horse. Pony One Kenobi is a part-time Jedi Master and a well-known small horse celebrity who has performed at many of the major conventions in the fandom, as well as the Music Questria Tour in 2013. Founder of the Beatles Bronies, Pony One Kenobi is a multi-instrumentalist and a talented musician, and he joins us here tonight. Hello, Pony One Kenobi. Hello. Welcome to another episode <laughs> of Elements of Harmony. How are you doing tonight? That was a fantastic intro. I love that. Yes, it was amazing. <laughs> Forrest, strong with the horse, really? Are you infinite it, now? That was, yes. Who was that? That was Infinite's idea, and that was like, uh, yeah, that was my idea as well. That was Snowblitz that <laughs> came up with that line. But then yeah. he, oh, yes. I thought you drew it from the old Reliant K song, May the Horse Be With You. No, <laughs> no. But you can wow. tell us about that. Yeah. Oh come on! You're the other Reliant K fan. Here. I know, I know, I know. But I only listened. I I only listened to the one album. <laughs> what? <laughs> I only listened to like mm hmm, and like I never downloaded anything else from Reliant what? K. What? I know. Shut up. Leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, um, <sighs> P1K and I have a little bit of history. Um, he was like one of my first friends coming into this fandom. Actually, I think. Mm hmm. So yeah. how did you two meet? All the way back to the Massive Smile Project. Is that how we met? Oh. Yep. Whoa. I met everybody wow. I love through the Massive <laughs> Smile Project. I even met you through that. Yeah, well, except for uh, almost everybody here. Yeah, so we we met back in the Massive Smile Project. That's neat, actually. Yep. How'd you hear about that? How did Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, that was ages ago. All right, well, we were still really high, hot in the heels of the Beetle Bronies. We were still... Really making a lot of tracks, Liam, really, um, uh, being active. Uh, we were one of the most active musicians in the early time, but uh, uh, even though some of our tracks were shit, uh, a lot of our tracks were shit. <laughs> um, but, but we learned but a lot. But authentic. Yeah, they were authentic. We learned a lot. We learned how to record. We learned how to really, um, uh, I learned how to master, mix and master. I eventually just moved up from Audacity to FL Studio, then to Cubase most recently. Uh, I learned a whole lot about how to make music was starting with the Beatle Bronies and overpowered my inability to play guitar by recruiting other people to play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Massive Smile Project, you approached us that wanted to have one or two of us uh, um, contribute uh, vocal parts. And uh, one of our members, Osoth, did that, and he was really happy to do that. Yeah, he was a soloist. Uh-huh. He was one of the soloists. Um, I provided the bass for the Smile Song. Yes, you did. I still remember the bass line. I love playing it. It's fun. Yeah. So that's how we first met Forrest. Then came BronyCon 2012. Summer BronyCon. Yes. Yes. Where Forrest's reign was cut due to time, like a few weeks before the con, and we all felt really bad, so <laughs> me and QD Brony um, gave him the last song in our set, and we played, actually, the a song that was written by Osoth, uh, Memory Lane, and that's one of Forrest's early hits. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I remember that those was old days. was incredibly fun. Those old days were great, because, like, you used to, like, well, you, you, me, you, everybody, would, like... You know, just, we watch the show, we'd be inspired, we'd write a song, a song would happen. Songs just happened back then. Songs just happened. We went, we did a cover of BBBFF yes. in 18 hours. D was no. It? no, it was like... It was eight hours. It was, yeah, it was like eight hours. <laughs> the majority of it happened within like a six hour span. Uh -huh. I think it was like eight hours from, hey, we should do a cover of this to, oh, hey, we just released a cover YouTube. of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was neat. From concept to YouTube, like eight hours. Yeah, it was pretty good. It yeah. happened in one night. I I think it was exactly just one night. Let's make it speed punk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I love that one. 
It was great. <laughs> Especially at the end, where it just kind of got all sad and depressing. Oh, yeah. I remember, like... We, like, dude, we, you should do a piano solo. Yeah, we discussed that. You're like, hey, well, you should do that, like, the reprise at the end. I'm like, you sure? You don't think it's going to be too sad or, like, completely, like, out of the concept of the whole thing? And you're like, no, nah, no, nah, just do it. No, 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 no. It's com- it was completely awesome. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Horribly yeah. mixed, but it worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm. that was the old days. Back when all the live music was horribly mixed. Yeah, and, <laughs> and recorded music. But yeah. I, I, this is just like so much nostalgia for me now in like the first five minutes of this episode. Um, oh, yeah. Because like, I remember like first meeting you and you showed me the Beatles brony stuff and I'm like, it's it's, it's authentic. It's, it's good. <laughs> your, your mixing really sucks, but... I can work on it. And then we... I got, used, wow. I, I did what I could with audacity. Yeah, and well, and we did. And like, I, I remember like we would discuss things and like I'd show you mixing techniques. I'd be like, hey, like this is this and blah, blah, blah. And like we'd, we'd work on stuff. Uh huh. And yeah, no, it's just, it's good times. I miss those days sometimes. <laughs> the early days of the fandom, I guess. Early days. Yeah. I miss once yeah. was a time. Yeah. And that BronyCon was when I remember, I remember when, um, uh, Great to be different was brooding inside Forrest's mind. Hmm. I, I remember seeing that. I came back to the hotel room and he was just sitting there on the bed, like contemplating shit. And he was like, "I found this, got this letter, and it, it, it's like I was like crying earlier. It's like really spoken to me. I'm like, I need to write a song." Hmm. And then I did. Oh, is that what happened? Well, that's seriously what there happened. was a conversation at yeah at the hotel. I remember too. I believe that same that same convention. Um, and that same hotel room we tried to write a song. Yeah, we're like we need to write a song about the convention or something And I can't remember what we were gonna write. It was something about <laughs> I remember what it is. Hang on. Let me go grab a ukulele. Oh boy <laughs> Oh Oh boy. Here we oh, go oh, oh. Okay, Wait, um, do you still have the lyrics that we wrote too? I think um, It's um, like um, oh, yeah, I'm it's gonna, just um... in my pile of convention lyrics <laughs> here right beside me wow. <laughs> Just in, in my lyrics of forgotten dreams <laughs> Oh. <laughs> the I'm forgotten sorry. lyric pile. I rem- I, I yeah. have a binder of just stuff I put together. There's a lot of stuff I haven't uh, released yet, and just never gotten around to doing. But um, uh, sounds like the notes in my iPhone. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember what we did for the verse, but the chorus went like, Brony con, oh Brony. Oh my God! Yes. Who knew you'd be so much fun? Why is this line so fucking long? I just want to see Terra strong. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> oh man! I remember! <laughs> oh, oh my god, I feel god. like I just took a trip to Neverland and I found my happy <laughs> thought. <laughs> that's that's amazing. This whole wow. Brownie wow. Con, that, that was con. really catchy. <laughs> oh my god, we need to finish that song! Many friends from many yeah. nations meeting for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can you please finish that? We'll work um, on it this BronyCon. Well, not yeah, saying I will feature it on anything, but <laughs> this maybe. this BronyCon we will Who get knows? together and we will work on that. Or maybe we'll I don't know. I feel like you should do that in, in on in the many concert. Nations. If it's finished by the con, con, yeah. then we'll all sing it together. Yeah, you should do it in Bronypalooza. Just, Just do, do it. it. <laughs> Just do it. People Just do it. Bronypalooza is usually it. pretty tight. I like yeah. I usually have a lot of things I want to play. I, right? I want to make sure I get to I know you always have it's always so much time, there's always not enough. Yeah, yeah. It's like thirty minutes. It's like oh I could do so much with 30 minutes no no i can't you really no i not yeah i've got to have a set that flows into each song and i have to want to hit the want to hit my high notes and i want to hit my new stuff and it's like oh yeah yeah uh or i want to hit this joke by playing this song like this or (laughs) okay so we uh, we we just spent like 10 minutes reminiscing and talking about stuff but like I, I guess we have to go into the the default question that i ask at the beginning of every interview which is uh for the people that are completely blind and deaf to the fandom and like never tuned in to a, a convention ever or never attended one and have never met you or don't know who you are mm-hmm. tell us who you are what you do and where you come from all right well hello everybody i am pony one kenobi or as i known as p1k um i do alternative rock alternative punk rock a style similar to reliant k blink 182 all american rejects i try and get a lot of uh, inspiration from different uh alternative artists all time low some 41 all sorts of things um 
I started in the fandom actually by playing Beatles parodies with my band, the Beatle Bronies. And, but, uh, ever since February of 2012, I have been writing my own stuff, producing it. And, uh, I've actually got a, a lot farther than the Beatle Bronies did. And, uh, just made a career for myself, I guess. Hmm. One of the first things I liked to really, really was interested in doing was, um, getting into the convention scene, being able to play shows. Um, I hadn't been, very experienced before in playing live shows, but I learned a whole lot during the first year, and then also through going to the tour on 2013, and um, that was an amazing experience. If you didn't see me on there, you missed out. It was a fantastic time. So yeah, that is me. I play Pony Punk. We already mentioned a little bit about your convention experience. What's the first convention you went to? The first convention I went to was January BronyCon of 2012. The third ever BronyCon, back when they were doing it, like, quarterly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, the very first one, yeah. The one that was wow. in uh, Manhattan. That's fine. The one was in Manhattan. The Hotel Pennsylvania was the smallest thing ever. Um, if the <laughs> Fire Marshal had showed up, we would have all been kicked out, like, immediately. I met, oh, yeah. <laughs> I met a whole <laughs> bunch of people there. I met Final Draft there for the first time. Uh, Apple Cider Shelf Sandy, but I guess maybe you're not supposed to say that in here on Everfree Radio. Um... <laughs> I met Tarby and Lasfas there for the first time, and <sighs> ever since then, that sparked an amazing friendship between me and Tarby. I was going to say. Um, I begged him to let me play bass for him at BronyCon um, and that summer, and ever since, we've just been amazing, amazing friends, and actually, we're cousins. What? Wow. Are you really? What? what? Like, what? legitimate? We are, we are almost sure that we are related somehow. That's neat. Really? Whoa. How'd you figure that That's out? That's amazing. Well, we were on tour. We were out at the beach in uh, Houston, around Houston Beach. And then, so, like, I was talking with my parents. I'd just gotten off the phone. I was like, what you doing? I was just calling my parents. They're about to head up to Rhode Island for a family reunion. Like, oh, yeah, my family usually has a reunion up there the same time of the year. Um, uh, when is it? Like, this weekend. Like, my family has a family reunion in Rhode Island this weekend. Where? At this park. Mine's at that park. <laughs> and we're like, we did a little bit of research, and we think, we haven't found anything conclusive yet, but we're pretty sure that there's some sort of relation between us. So it's like a relationship like how Applejack and Piggy Pie are related to each other. <laughs> exactly. <almost. laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing episode. <laughs> Still, that's really awesome. <laughs> Amazingly relatable. It's a small, small world. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it really Isn't is. Isn't it, though? I want to ask you about um, Music Equestria. How was that, and how did it go the entire time? It was an experience. Um, uh, early on, we uh, encountered a few difficulties. Basically, we didn't have the um, uh, vehicles we wanted, so we had to take two vehicles, and that just stressed a lot of things. And you do not want to spend a month in the back of a um, uh, Chevy Traverse mm. with six <laughs> other people. Isn't that how you learned how to swear? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> The fetting is the one you want to watch out for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, oh, man. Um, How were they? We all grew very close. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that from, like, uh, just sort of starting at the beginning of the story when uh, everybody sort of came together for the first time. Like, how did that go? From We came together for the first time uh, a day before Everfree Northwest. We had rented a space just to rehearse. And it was me, Tarby, Automatic Jack, Replacer, and Don uh, as the band. We were rehearsed for the first time. And just for a few of the songs, we just completely meshed. And it just worked. And it was like, yes, this is magical. This is going to work. Up with their songs, it was like, that was shit. We need to start over again. The first half of the tour, just hitting each um, uh, sit city like every other day sometimes. And then a stretch where we went from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, one day. The next day, we played in Albuquerque, and then the next day, we played in Houston. Mm -hmm. Now, the gap between Albuquerque and Houston is a 22-hour drive uh. with a time zone loss. Oh, wow. 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 So, we got off the stage in Albuquerque, took everything down, packed up, left, got to Houston, and put on a show. Wow. That's crazy. Man, that is crazy. And how did so the Houston show go? It was okay. 
<laughs> now, <laughs> I just it? wanted to ask about your naming off all these cities. Were there any cities that were your favorite to perform at, and did any catch you by surprise? Portland was one of the first was the first stop on the tour, other than Everfree Northwest, and that was our biggest crowd. We had so many people there. It was in like the upstairs of a restaurant. It was actually one of our. It was one of the smallest venues, but it was incredibly okay. fun. We got to play like a smaller ish set just by like just a lighter set. We didn't have everything going full blast. Um, but it really worked and re- everyone really enjoyed it. From what I hear, um, the music scene and like just the artist scene in Portland is really, really supportive. Mm hmm. I wouldn't know because I was there for two days, but yeah, sure. <laughs> but carrying on, your second favorite city? Second favorite city is between LA and Nashville. Oh, uh, yeah. LA was this dive of a venue. It was the only indication that it was a venue was a stenciled name of it on the door of this ruddy looking shack. <sighs> it was like <laughs> <It's> Fluttershy <laughs> shit. But the thing was it it was a secret venue. It was like a lot of like big people had done secret shows in this tiny ass room. And like and then we were playing there and I got to play I played on um, uh Beverly Hills, <laughs> of course, just as a homage to where we were and that was <laughs> incredibly fun i really enjoyed playing at that venue and the, uh, nashville was just nashville's like it's like a city of music it was fantastic mm. um i yeah. um i got to i played a reliant k cover like 15 miles from where it was recorded so i was like this is so cool <laughs> wow mm-hmm <laughs> Yeah, I was actually at the Nashville show, and you guys did a fantastic job. Yeah, it was that was a really it was a really fun venue. It really felt full. It was a nice, it was a good size, good size crowd, good size venue. Mm-hmm. It all worked out. And I remembered a lot of the people being surprised how crowded it was because that one hadn't been announced in the original tour, and it wasn't even on the website. It was just announced like twenty four hours ahead of time or something like. Oh, that. Oh yeah, it, it, that was a um mid tour edition talk about hardcore Mm. fans but the thing about the thing about the second half (laughs) of the tour though is that after that show in houston we had like nothing we had nashville Mm -hmm. and uh tallahassee that was it so there were long gaps of us doing nothing and wasting all of our money so Mm. (laughs) (laughs) we ran out of money pretty quick uh we didn't have enough gas money to actually get up to our chicago show we had to cancel that booking oh Oh, oh, brutal, man. man. Wow. That's stinks. <laughs> yep. So, are, were these some of your first times you'd ever performed at um, a live venue other than a convention, or had you performed at other live venues? Uh, I guess, yeah, it would be the first time I actually played at venues. I've, like, I played at stuff like church events or whatever, the conventions, of course. But I had never had actually played at a venue itself, and that was really a unique experience. Um, how many people do you think were there that weren't bronies? <laughs> Not many. There weren't many people that there were there that were bronies. <laughs> we had an average of like twenty people a show. It was kind of poor. Mm. Portland was our biggest with fifty, and then it was all was, downhill from there. Uh, it was pretty much downhill from there. That's one of the reasons why we also kept running out of money. <laughs> was there was there a worst venue like of the worst performance in there? Ah, <sighs> worst perf. Uh, mm. Uh, uh, uh. No, I can't say there was. Huh. Well, hey, you know what? If you guys come back to Nashville, we'll see about breaking <laughs> 50. <laughs> you just have to announce it with more than 24 hours. Nashville was one of the good ones. I think we had like 35 people, 35, yeah. 40. It was a good number there. <laughs> wow. Other, Pretty much everywhere else, though, was yeah. like 20. All right. Well, anyways, we're going to take a quick song break here. And the song we're about to play is... Oh, this is in relation to a certain mother pony with some... Some of them bed eyes that are very well. Anyways, this is P1K with Button's Mom. You are listening to Elements of Harmony on Everfree Network. After school, after 
trying to give me the slip, slip, slip. Give me the slip. No, I'm not the little cold that I used to be. I'm all grown up. I'm a stallion, can't you see? Bucky's mom has got it going on. She's all that I want, and I waited for so long. Bucky, can't you see? You're just not the cop for me. I'm oh, so the glad. Are amazing. Right, it is. They really just are. Came out they are just so, so spectacular. <laughs> yeah, like it was really well produced, and I remember you getting that up very quickly after Button's Adventure had aired. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that song and the inspiration? Well, it all started with a Tumblr post. <laughs> That's how it always starts, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, um, uh, yeah. Someone had made it. It, it, it was an audio <laughs> post. Someone had, of course, the original Stacy's mom, and then like a speech, um, a speech generator saying "button" just over Stacy every time it had come up. <laughs> and me and Hard Copy saw this post and like, dude, this has to happen. So Hard Copy started up the lyrics, and then I started the backtrack. And then we, I just, we just tried to pump it out. I just wanted to make it as good as it possibly could be. I didn't want to use a backtrack. Like I didn't want to use just like a pre-made um, uh, instrumental or whatever. Uh, yeah, instrumental like other people were trying to do, and then eventually Cypony did with his most popular one. But uh, so yeah, that that happened. Like Cypony put out his version in the right in the middle of uh, me producing the my version, and. Uh, I was almost tempted to not do it, but I'm like, you know what? I could make this sound incredibly awesome. I know I can make this the best it can be. And so I kept going at it. I kept making the track. I kept uh, getting better and better at mixing. I sent it to so many people trying to get a really, really nice sound out of it. I put a lot of effort into the vocals. There are eight vocal tracks wow. on there. Did you like triple, yeah. triple do all the vocals? Wow. Or? I double did all the vocals, but there's three vocal parts in the chorus. If memory serves me right, it, it seems like that had published within a week of Button's Adventure, so you must have been really frantic getting that out to people. It was two weeks. Okay, at two least. Weeks. I had the track mostly finished like a week out, a week and a half. I was waiting on art, but I used that time to nitpick and really get that mix sounding as incredible as it does. Yeah, it really is one of your, your best produced tracks. Um, yeah, so there's eight vocal tracks. I have them all like compressed and tuned together. I posted just a teaser of it, of just the vocals of the second chorus, just with all the harmonies and just everything sounding so awesome. I'm like, I'm so happy at this. This is going to be fantastic. 
<laughs> is, is there anything you felt that you really took away from this? Like anything specific that you felt that you learned a lot about? Uh, I learned a lot about compressing vocals and um, how I how I can get everything to sound even throughout the track. And I learned that I I can't I can't rely on compressors to make a uh, track the audio track sound good. Sometimes you do have to go into automation. I hate automation. <laughs> I hate having to change automate. I hate having to change the volume for a track. I like being able to set it and then use a compressor to ha- get everything to fit evenly. But uh, I just learned that sometimes you just have to sacrifice that. You have to put in some automation to really get a really nice sound out of it. Yeah, and I was gonna, oh, and I was just gonna do a follow up question. Was was there anything you felt that you realized that you were a little bit weak in? Um, the harmonies aren't right. <laughs> I made them up based yeah. on the chords and based on <laughs> but, what I heard. There's a few harmony parts missing, and I added a few, actually. Uh, see, yeah. the thing with P1K is P1K is a master at vocal harmonies. Like, if P1K does Yay. anything better than anybody else in the fandom, it's vocal harmonies. And actually, just as an example of that, I did uh-huh. pull up the uh, the vocal demo that he put out for Buttons Mom, so we're going to listen to that real quick. It's, it's only 16 seconds, so. Yay! Buttons mom has got it going on She's all that I want and I've waited for so long Button can't you see that she's just the man for me I know it might be wrong but I'm in love with Buttons mom Yeah, yeah that sounds yeah, very so good see, yeah, I love wow. it, it's love so it. Good. Remember, Something I learned from musical theater It's all about come-ons and come-offs like you, you gotta punch right. it. You gotta be come in at exactly the same time, and you gotta come off in the exact same way. You have to sing the track exactly how the lead does it. If you play it one more time, right. you'll hear how everything sounds unison and how every part comes on and pops off at the exact same time. I went to a lot of effort to make sure that's had it right. Play it one more time. Yeah. Buttons, mom has got it going on. She's all that I want, and I waited for so long. Button, can't you see that she's just the man for me? I know it might be wrong, but I'm in love with Buttons, Mom. That lead track is actually two tracks. It's a double track, and you can barely tell because they sung so precisely mm-hmm. on. For sure. That's it's interesting. all about just, like like I said, musical theater. Like, open your mouth, enunciate everything, and then you're... Your come ons and come offs. I have a feeling we're going to have a very interesting tech talk about vocal mm-hmm. harmonies. Aha. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I actually want to talk more in depth on that because they told us the same thing in marching band and concert band about the attacks and the exactly. off. And there's a lot in terms of the way the waves interact where that helps amplify mm-hmm. them. Yeah, anything like that, like a marching band, like a choir, like an ensemble, you have to be together. And when you are, it sounds fantastic. And you said there were eight yeah. people of the vocal in the chorus, there right? There were eight, eight, vocal, eight vocal tracks, tracks, three harmony tracks, and a lead track. There's only eight tracks in a couple spaces, actually, and mostly towards the end of the song when I have when I'm singing an extra part for um uh, the lead vocals, where I have a triple. So I have a triple, a oh, three part harmony singing the chorus, and then I have my vocal harmony over it as the lead, and then um uh. Another song I really did that well was um, my cover of Bab Seed. Mm-hmm. That one had um, uh, 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 seven tracks. <laughs> it's it's funny when you mention this because I, I do the same thing where I use a, a ton of vocal tracks in some things, except most of the time my stuff doesn't come through as well as yours does. But um, mm-hmm. uh, I remember like um, when the rock band thing was a big thing that um, mm-hmm. I, I had sent off several tracks and like the first time that i did it um i was trying to think of how to like bounce all the tracks or or do stems for it because you know you can only fit i think three uh vocal tracks into rock band it's a single vocal track but there's only there's only three harmony parts you can right so a lead and then three harmony parts right no two two, lead and two harmony harmony parts. parts right okay and um yeah i just remember thinking you know i i even said to the guy one time i'm like well there's five vocal tracks kind of going right now and like in the chorus here. So like, how do you want me to do those? He's like, just pick some I'm like, okay. You, you pick the most interesting, interesting ones. Like they just, one of the guys that did, um, uh, uh, buttons mom, like he, he just picked a couple. I'm like, and at the end it was like, uh, dude, could we switch this vocal track here? Can you use this harmony <laughs> here? It's more interesting, more fun to sing. And it's more apparent in the mix. So yeah. like, yeah, the one he had initially, and the one that's actually in the video is actually like the Barry harmony. It's just, it's very, 
very stagnant. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I just love vocal harmonies. Like I grew up, I grew up listening to the Beatles, and they're like famous for their harmonies and different uh, amazing tracks. I also oh, the Beatles were yeah, the Beatles were fantastic. They're the reason like they broke up like so many like different types of rock genres. Uh-huh. Like they're like the, the, they're like one of the pioneers. Grew up so, yeah. the Beatles. We've seen this guy with diamonds. Reliant K and like other alternative rock like is characterized almost by the third harmony. Mm. Like it's always there. And you'll, it's right. a, it's a incredibly present. And from listening to it so often and singing along to it and singing that harmony, as I developed like that natural tendency, like okay, I know where the third is, and I can just sing along to almost any song in a third harmony. During Bernicon 2012 uh, in the summer, uh, I was in Secaucus, New Jersey. You did a pre Bronicon show. Yeah. Uh, and I saw it up on YouTube. So, h- how was that? Because from a viewer's point of view, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching all the musicians kind of chilling out and being it was terrible doing their thing live. <laughs> Don't watch it. it. Was- <laughs> Skip over the part with Forest Rain. It was terrible. <laughs> Except for the one song. The one song we practiced mm-hmm. turned out really well, and that's uh-huh. yeah. P O K. Tell us about it. That was an exper- That was fun. Like, um, it was meeting back with a bunch of friends that I'd made. Well, of course, I met a few people at BronyCon mm-hmm. January. And this was the next con after that. The next like only other con that that summer except for Everfree Northwest, the first Everfree Northwest. Um what happened it just really um uh, kind of spawned naturally. Like I don't know, I brought on a little webcam just in case we wanted to stream something. It was like we just s- sat up like behind one of the um hotels. I was in like a little courtyard. Yep. Uh it was you, me, and QD and then I'm a uh, uh, Brony Mike, and then later we had uh, Cyril and uh, Tarby stop yeah. by. It was just, it was just spot spontaneous, and uh, it really characterized like the beginning of that um uh, first convention. Like, all right, this is we are friends now. We are, we are meeting for the first time, but then we're just going in and just playing music. We are just out of nowhere, just like we never played before together and we just play and it's magic it was one of the most romantic moments of of brony con like a situational romance in a sense in that like it's just almost like ironically prophetic that we all just kind of meet and start to uh to play music and just put on a, a concert because we can in a courtyard behind the hotel and stream it out to people <laughs> we started yeah. playing memory lane and then just like a crowd of like 20 or so bronies walked by and just crowded around insane. us and started singing along that was insane yeah. <laughs> so you guys became like the avengers of brony musicians <laughs> <laughs> basically yeah. i don't know i i, I think that'd be 2010 yeah. but i don't know yeah. if they only released yeah. anything <laughs> With this, though, that's a weird bragging point. Kind of a, not weird, but rare one where you've played at the past three Brony Cons. What's it been like watching a convention just start off really small and grow to what it is today? Well, the first Brony Con I played at, I jumped on stage behind Jackalap and started playing <laughs> drums. But, uh, okay. <laughs> it was kind of um, unprecedented or just <laughs> random. Uh, it's been a really weird, interesting experience seeing the convention scene grow into what it was last year at BronyCon. Oh my gosh, it was huge. I've, I've seen bands on stages that big, and I've, I've seen famous people on stages that big, and now I'm a person on stage, and there are people out there, I'm playing a song, and I can see in people, they're singing along, they know my songs, I'm like, oh my god. I made it! You know my songs! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I it's like, imagine. this is what it feels like to be famous. Oh, I done it. Yeah, I was talking about that with somebody recently, because when I saw Slayer, Megadeth, Anthrax, that crowd was about the same size as Brony Palooza's, so at your <laughs> level of music, what is it like playing to that kind of audience? It is just it's so exciting. The energy is just palpable. Uh, I couldn't see the back of the crowd, mostly because of the haze, <laughs> but it just made it... There was a lot of hate on this stage, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. that illusion, like there's just people, and then I can't see the end of it. And there, there, and there are a lot of people in there come to see me, and they know my music. I can see them <laughs> singing it. <laughs> and with that being said, were you how nervous when you when you uh, saw the crowd and knew how Absolutely many people were not. there? It was fantastic. <laughs> I haven't had a problem with stage fright since um, ever. F- Jude, I was gonna <laughs> sophomore year of high school. Like P one K is just one of those people that anytime there's a stage or a camera, he's there. 
P1K is there. If there's a stage <laughs> no. and there's an instrument yeah, nearby, not- he's there. It doesn't matter what's going on. Like, they're, oh, like if, if Turquoise Splash was playing out front, P1K would be there with, like, bongos just playing along because he can. I'm the guy who's just, like, gravitationally <laughs> attracted to pianos, so... <laughs> Oh, you <laughs> and me both. There is a uh, piano in my um, Keystone testing area, which I'm going to see next week. And it's an upright, or not an upright, it's a full grand piano Ooh. just sitting there. And I asked the teacher after the testing was over, I think I spent an extra half hour sitting mm-hmm. there, and I played it for a good hour. There was, <laughs> it reminds me, in preparation for uh, BronyCon 2013, it's like, you know what would be awesome? We had a full grand piano. And then like, they're like, we can get you that. Like, you yeah. can? I remember, <laughs> I remember watching That's the stream awesome. uh, for one convention. I don't remember what it was. Uh, maybe it was Everfree, where they had a full... They had a full yeah. grand. No, no, uh, it was, was, a, it? It was okay. a mini grand. It was a mini grand. Mini grand. But, and it was pinned to one spot. Yes. So we had to mic it like over and, the side yeah. of the stage. But... <laughs> One of my most memorable moments, though, from Everfree Northwest, for that for that um uh, piano was was I got I woke up. Of course, I'm an East Coaster, so when I travel to the West Coast, I'm three hours ahead. So I wake up at like <laughs> seven a.m. Like, oh right, I'm ready to start the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I ended up going really early over to the venue and just up to the um uh, main ballroom, and the Creepers had just gotten there. Oh man. Um uh yeah uh. Andy, Ed, and Jimmy were also up there. They were all up rehearsing. Then the Recreebers got there, and they did an, well, what would be best described as an acoustic rehearsal with Mr. Creeber on that mini grand. Um, oh, man. Ed playing the drums really lightly, and then uh, Mando on my bass and uh, Jimmy on guitar, and that was just magical. <laughs> Hearing that was just a light version of different songs, stuff, songs they didn't even actually end up playing at Everfree Northwest. They played, like, <laughs> uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band. They played... Oh, uh, I can't remember anymore. But it was just magical. It was like hearing this light rehearsal. I'm just sitting here watching Michelle dance around <laughs> and sing. And then Claire came up and she came up and started dancing with uh, Michelle. It was just... <laughs> that was the most yes. memorable time I've ever had a convention. Just hearing that light rehearsal. Hearing that just everyone just meshing together that that musical family and the and uh Custamando pony it was just amazing i have a quick somewhat random question you you were in the beatles bronies but personally how much influence do you feel you have from the beatles and who, if so who from the beatles do you feel most influence from quick correction on that i believe p1k actually founded the beatles bronies well to answer the question um like I said before, I like really inspired by their harmonies, how they really liked uh, using a lot of vo- different vocals. Uh, songs like Nowhere Man, mm. just like they have the constant three-level harmony. Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah, just everything just works <laughs> Yeah, there. that's a good one. And I'd say that I'm most inspired by Paul. In, in case you weren't aware and haven't seen me live, I play a Hofner, which was most famously played by Paul McCartney. It's a short-scale, hollow-body bass. And it's got a really unique sound to it. It looks like a violin, also known as a violin bass. It's just an incredibly unique bass. It's got a unique sound to it, and I just love playing it. I play it at all my shows, and I have now taken it to Australia and on tour across the country, and it, I am never, ever getting rid of this guitar. <laughs> I've actually seen one of them in Guitar Center a long while back, and I couldn't help myself but picking it up and playing it, even though I don't play bass. Yeah, it was just so awesome looking. The thing about it, what you find in a store though, is that they've got cheap nickel round wounds on it, and they just sound like yeah. the thing is made out of tin. I swear, <laughs> if you play a Hofner with round wounds, it sounds like the guitar is made out of tin. It's just awful. You have to get the right uh, strings for it. Generally, when you find a good sounding guitar in Guitar Center, you know it's good guitar. <laughs> Definitely. Especially with those strings that they put on there. Uh, one of my most memorable moments with PNK was this one time at um, Starborn's house where we were playing rock band. <laughs> and yes. PNK decided to play rock band while laying upside down on the floor, looking up at the TV, upside down, playing the guitar and singing vocals at the same time. And like you reversed the image on the on the screen or something like that for it. Yeah, put you put it in lefty, lefty mode, mode so they, <laughs> so they can read it properly. 
Oh, yeah, it's and and you wound up doing really well. I think you got like a 99% on the vocals and a 96% on the guitar or something. That's about right. <laughs> wow. That is impressive. God. Wow. Yeah. I can't even play that stinking game upright I like, can't play it at all except positioned. for vocals. I'm boss at vocals, but I can't do anything else. But yeah, no, that's... And did he... Wait, did he play it on yeah. professional? Yeah, I played it on yeah, a, pro. expert. Yeah, expert. Yeah, I'm not worthy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just one of those moments where it's like, not only is P1K an awesome musician, he's also freaking boss at at uh, rock band. <laughs> In the beginning of my Brony musical career, I had only really played uh, piano and a bit of bass. I had a... Um, uh, just a really cheap P bass, and um, that's all I played. And just like, okay, I can play one string at a time. I'm good at that. I had no idea how to play guitar. That's why I tried to. I recruited other people. And we made a tra- bunch of tracks together. Um, but um, as time went on, I picked up like a ukulele. I picked up. I picked up things that are re- easy to finger. You can use finger the chords. Like I really, I learned a lot of on ukulele. Learned how to play that. I would play um, a bunch of different songs just by learning very simple chords and then by using that the strum patterns that i'd learned from playing rock band and the music theory that i already knew from playing piano i was able to eventually graduate to guitar i borrowed one from my cousin and uh i ended up just working with that for as long as i possibly could before i put out um uh Caramel's Light, which was my very first song, and featured a very, very simple lead line that I put together, and it was very, uh, I don't know what to say, uh, unprofessional or whatever. Uh, rough. It was my very first. It was a very simple song. Rough. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. It was very rough, but I was learning to play guitar, and now I'm a whole lot better. I've learned a lot of dexterity. It just, it's very cool, just how how learning new instruments has just come along. So real quick, we're going to go into a quick music break. And now introducing Crystal Heart featuring um, Turquoise Splash, a song by Pony One Kenobi. You're listening to Elements of Harmony on Everfree Radio. I can't tell you when it started in my mind and my thoughts would drift to you from time to time but now this feeling's getting worse It's like I'm trapped under a curse A carrying hand upon this lonely heart of mine She seems so close but she's so far away And I never feel like I can find the words to say But I don't want to break this spell I let these feelings just a spell But all that I can do is take things day by day Can't you see?
the words I say, they're never right. I try and try most every night, so now. Remember when you first showed me that song? Uh huh. And it it really touched me when you first put it out, and it's just it's a really really sweet song, and um, I, I'm glad that we were able to feature it tonight. And um, it's 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 a well produced sort of, I guess, alternative ballad sort of. Yeah, exactly. I took a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, I took a lot of inspiration from a Hawk Nelson song and um, uh, some Reliant K stuff like. I put it the song in E flat standard, uh, which is uh, really actually a popular key for Line K. It's like the Daniel Ingram key. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yes. um, and it has a very similar uh, line to it that's like similar to their song uh, "Forget and Not Slow Down." Like it kind of used some of the same chords and how they slide up. That mm -hmm. that slide you hear during the chorus, like going up and down, mm -hmm. um, is just is really it's an adaptation of one of the one of. Uh, Reliant K's uh, lead rhythm parts for uh, their song "Forget and Not Slow Down," and so hmm. a lot of music is just being inspired by other things and taking bits and pieces and using them as they as they fit. Yeah, the secret to being an artist is hiding your sources. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> um, yeah. But one of the uh, one of the things, since we are talking about the elements of vocal harmonies today. Um, uh, one of the things that strikes me about this song is that, um, and actually about a lot of the songs that you put out, is that there's a very present uh vocal harmony that carries through the entire mm -hmm. song pretty much so it's it's almost as if you have two people singing the song the entire way through but uh, tell us a little bit about that and uh and your process with that i tend to actually just like think in like the two vocal way like i can think i always think in my melodies and i always think like the mel the harmony is right here it's probably going to be there most of the song and i tend to actually overuse it if you listen to most like alternative rock like you'll hear like the third harmony a lot mm -hmm. like, during the chorus and verses stuff but it's not always there i tend to be overuse it just a little bit on this track in particular actually um i used it quite a lot yep. i also took a risk in only doing single tracks for both the uh lead vocal and the harmony vocal um i wanted it to sound a bit more raw a bit more um pure yeah. because of how because of the uh, more acoustic more um just drawn back feel to it um, except for the chorus part, the choral parts in the back, those are both double tracked. So there's four tracks back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really wanted to add those just because what before there's just empty space. They're like, can't you see this feeling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just empty space. Right. That big silence. <laughs> It just wasn't being. I had I had like a lead guitar line that like that that's still there. Like da 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 da. But it's just not present, and I, I just couldn't get it to sound present enough without it overpowering. Yeah. And it but but then I thought, what if I added more vocals here and kind of made it like more chorusy? <laughs> and then as I I just I just I just sang a part just randomly, just like thought of what it could be. And then as the chorus went on, like oh. This really works, so I can go like da, da. it just it really just came alive. Just like okay, I need something here. Oh, it's now grown into something right. else. Welcome to one of the secrets of producing music. Exactly. <laughs> if you have space, lot... stick vocals in there. Yeah. If you have space, put something put in some there. Put some ahs and oohs. 
Yeah, if you have space anywhere, if you have space laterally, just like there's like empty space in the lyrics and the sound, if there's empty space in the spectrum, throw in an instrument that just fills things yeah. out or just add an extra guitar track or whatever. Oh, Let me take some notes. It's all about yeah. filling the space. It's about filling the space a lot of the time. Mm, yeah. And also by using empty space, I drop into the chorus, I lower my vocals so that um, I'm filling more of a register with my voice. Because like, like, when you're... The vocals have like a lot of a uh, high frequencies to them. When you're singing high, they're emphasized. But when you drop down the vocals, drop down an octave, you're singing deeper, and everything resonates more. Especially with the really light um uh, guitar work there from Turquoise. Just like yeah, the voice can fill a set, fill a space, but not if you're singing too high. It all, it all depends. Use the empty space. Yeah, it's it's similar to mixing. It doesn't just apply to vocals, it applies to almost everything. Um, in the sense that, you know, if there's if there's space in your track, you know, like you said, laterally, like within time, you can fill it with, uh, you know, like a lead guitar part or vocals or, you know, something just to sort of stick in there or like a, a synth pad or some piano. Um, and if there's space in your track, uh, like frequency wise, you can find instruments to put in there. Uh, that work in that frequency. If you so, if there's not a lot of high frequencies, you can add in some high vocal harmonies. You can add in some uh, um, some like strings, spiel or, or strings. Like, like you said, a pad. Yeah, I'm a really big fan of being the prog person that I am. I love when people use Mellotron, the vocal harmonies from a Mellotron. Or one of my favorites, the Rhodes piano. Ah, uh, mm. yes, mm. yes. I love Rhodes piano, glass piano, metal piano. They. Um, and in case you're not familiar with the instrument, it's uh, like a piano, except that metal bars are used and are hit with um, uh, ha- with the hammers, and that use makes a tone. But it's also incredibly subtle, and you can't hear it if you actually play it. It has to be amped, kind of like a um, uh, like an early organ. So mm-hmm. it has a somewhat of an organy sound, but like especially mm-hmm. like if you hear like cover of uh, Reliant K's um, uh, College Kids, yeah. I open mm-hmm. with the um, roads there. It's got a really bop, bop, bop. It's got a really punch to it, a bit more punch than an organ would have. Just because it's got that hammer hit, it's got that bang, and then it resonates. Like a, an organ, I always have trouble with organs because they're always just a bit harsh for me. Mm-hmm. Like, um, uh, you need to use like, like the, this track. You have to use the, the B organ more often. Yeah. Maybe. But, like, yeah, like in this track, in, Col- in um, uh, Crystal Heart, like there's an there's an underlying organ throughout almost the entire track. Just I use it as a bed of sound. Like I said, it fills a nice little frequency range that just is there. Um, especially in the opening, where it's just I have a fifth, just constantly going. Mm-hmm. I I just, I just didn't want it to sound harsh, so I just have a like, nice little fade in. It just just the fade in is just like because I had to because it sounded too harsh just coming yeah. in. You also realize that a lot of things that happen like songs, it's just completely random happenstance just like ah i need something here let's just throw that in oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or i can i can change a lyric on the fly yeah. like one of the other things i wanted to talk about just with uh harmonies um i i remember trying to talk about this with feather when you set forth to actually create a harmony um what's your process for that or do you find that you do uh, like fourths very often or fifths very often or anything like that is there any kind of like um technical thought that goes into it when you do it or does it just happen well technically speaking fourths are very interesting in that they can be well when you when you refer to a third harmony or even a fifth harmony the fourth often comes in as just a filler note because of how the chords work um but usually what i do is i usually just take a run at it i just go through the song and i just Mm -hmm. sing it and i try and just sing along add a harmony if it doesn't work, I go back and I look at it. Or if it's like slightly off, I'll go into like Melodyne or like the automatic tuner and I'll just like modify it. Think, oh, okay, there it is. I can sing that. And I go back and I re-record the actual new line that ah, I've just written by That's Emma. the way to use Melodyne going right back. there. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Sometimes I'm lazy. <laughs> like, oh, like especially in choral parts, I'm just lazy. Just like everything, because especially when you like um, double track things and it's a group thing you can very easily get away with just shifting things up like oh, i'll shift this up a whole note and just like make sure mm-hmm. everything works <laughs> it's easy to hide know what you can get away with when you <laughs> yeah when i'm actually creating harmonies it's usually just uh i usually just sing to the song i just try and sing along to it i don't rarely um uh like sit down and like think about mm-hmm. it too much just because i've had a lot of 
I've had a lot of experience just going through, singing along to a song, singing of a, uh, singing the melody, singing the harmony along with their melody, and even singing harmonies when they're not singing harmonies, and just adding my own little bits. And that's also probably also contributes to my problem of having too many <laughs> harmonies in a song. <laughs> Fifths don't come on nearly as often, but when they do, it's usually just to add a huge emphasis to where I really want a lot of bigness mm. to it. Like in Melody of My Heartstrings, the most prominent example is that like the line is, but there's one thing we can't agree that when we sing in harmony, I add an extra harmony part in there. So there's like three mm. vocal parts there and it just really works. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 funny when we when we talk about this stuff because it's Yes, we can quantify it into math, but nobody does. It's it's just not a thing that musicians, at least the musicians that I talk to most of the time, we we just don't actively think about the math that goes into harmonies. Um, it's just something that you kind of acquire an ear for, or you naturally have an ear for, and it just happens. Yeah, exactly. Um. Uh... The science of harmony is actually really, really cool, just how things work out with that. Yeah, because it's it's all based off of frequencies, right? And, and harmonies it's are essentially of multiples of your root. Exactly. You have a wavelength of sound, you double it, you get an octave. You multiply it by three, you get an octave and a fifth. You multiply it by four, you get another octave. You multiply it by five, you get two octaves and a third. And if that sounds complicated, it's because the frequency spectrum is not linear. It's not linear. It's a logarithmic curve. That's right. You've been in this fandom for a little bit, and you've been touring quite for a while now. You've been, I mean, you've been to a lot of conventions, and um, so, I mean, it's fair to say you've, you're fairly experienced. What would you give as advice to somebody who would like to follow in your footsteps and be a musician? Ah, that's always the great question. Um, it's all about just practice practice learn all that you can there are some natural talent to it that's like like i said before i like just seem to have a natural like has been said before <laughs> natural knack for vocal harmonies natural knack for vocal yep. harmonies yeah. and just the way i it would play it like i learned how to play guitar just because i wanted to make music and now i'm actually somewhat half decent for it i can actually play it in front of a crowd and sing along and actually sound decent um, just you gotta practice. You gotta try your best, and you gotta do it just because you like the music. It can't be just for fame or fortune. I know, like every probably almost everyone else that you had on this having this show say that you you can't be doing it for the fame. You gotta do it because you like music. There's also there's a huge element of luck here. <laughs> if I hadn't gotten lucky and gotten into January BronyCon because I was a musician or I'd found the right staff person that would let me upstairs and bypass the line that was too long to actually get into the convention. <laughs> if I hadn't have done that and hadn't met the people that I did there, I would not be where I am today. Luck is such a huge part. You just have to come along at just the right time with just the right thing. Sometimes you can uh, kind of fake it, kind of force it. Kind of like we did with Buttons Bomb. Like, okay, I know if I make a quality track here and I get it out within like a month-ish, it's going to be popular and it's yeah. going to work. Sometimes there's a formula to it. Like, uh, kind of like how Pixel Kitties always releases a new comic right after an episode. And that's part of advertising, really. Like, that's part of selling yourself. And also it comes with just the talent. It comes yeah. with the talent. Like, she's good at making art and yeah. good at making art quick. So she can do it and it just works. I have to say, within the last... How long have I known you? What, two and a half years now? Two and a half years. Yeah, so I've known you for two and a half years, and, like, the amount of progress that you've made from when we first met, and I mean, like, this applies to almost all of us, too. You, me, Cyril, all of us that kind of are in contact normally. Uh-huh. But, like, the amount of progress that you've made from what you were originally doing when we first met to the stuff that you're doing now has just been phenomenal. And it's... Yeah, it's just been very good talking to you and kind of reminiscing about stuff today. So thank you yeah. very much for coming on the show. It has been my absolute pleasure. I was I I really had a good time. I really liked I really liked looking back too. I I hadn't thought about a lot of those things for a while now. Yeah, it's good to appreciate um, the things you've done and the people you've seen and the people you've talked to and just kind of look back. Yeah, get back to your roots. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> check out this week's program 
On Wednesdays, we got KPMY at 7 p.m., followed by Into the Spotlight with Osaka Jack at 9 p.m. Then on Thursdays, we got Sketchy Sounds live songcast at 3 p.m. All times are in Central. Until next week, this is Starlight's Iron Hoof, Forest Rain, Midnight Rain, Zeta Prime, and Snow Blitz. Goodbye for now. She's all I want, and I've waited for so long. But can't you see that she's just the man for me? I know it might be wrong, but I'm in love with Buttons, Mom. I'm in love with Buttons, Mom. Wait a minute. But can't you see that she's just the man for me? I know it might be wrong, but I'm in love with Buttons, Mom.